everybody and welcome to Includes Podcast presented by Proxima Ledge Solutions. Before we go into our episode today, there is something that I really need to share with you guys because if you don't know, you need to know. So if you have not heard about Anchor, guys, it is the easiest way to make a podcast. And I said it is the easiest way because number one, it is free. Yes, it is free. There are also creation tools that are going to allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or your computer. It does not get any easier than that. But wait, there is more. Anchor is also going to distribute your podcast for you so that it can be heard on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and more. You can even make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership. It is everything really that you need to make a podcast and it is all in one place. So do me a favor, go in, download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. Hello, everyone, and welcome once again to Includes Podcast, presented by Proxima Ledge Solutions. I am your host, Marlene Marino, and I am super double excited to be here with you all today as I discuss something with you guys that is very just near and dear to my heart, and that is compliance. So in this episode, I will start by defining compliance, taking a closer look at the role of a compliance officer, as well as each step of the compliance plan, and who is ultimately responsible for compliance. But before we can talk about all of this, let me give you the million dollar question. What is healthcare compliance? Think about that question for a second. Think about it. We all have a definition of what we believe compliance is, right? We might have a compliance department in our organization, or maybe not a compliance department, but we might have somebody that it is designated to review any compliance issues, right? So what is healthcare compliance? Healthcare compliance is the ongoing process of meeting or exceeding legal, ethical, and professional standards applicable to a healthcare organization or medical practice. Healthcare compliance requires an effective development of processes, policies, and procedures to define the appropriate conduct, staff education, and staff monitoring to ensure that we are adhering to those guidelines. A culture of compliance promotes prevention, detection, and resolution of instances of conduct that do not conform to the government laws, public and private payer program requirements, and also ethical and business policies. The scope of compliance extends to many areas, including patient care. Um, It also includes billing, reimbursement, managed care contracting, researching standards, OSHA, yes, OSHA, the Joint Commission, and also HIPAA, the Privacy and Security Role. And that's only to just name a few. There is a whole bunch. So healthcare compliance means meeting all of the rules and requirements. Once again, health care compliance means meeting all of the rules and requirements that are applicable to an organization that is health care compliance. Now, what is the biggest challenge? The biggest challenge for health care organizations and their compliance officers is doing what? Keeping track of all of the requirements requirements and regulations. And we know this because why? We know this because not only are there a lot of regulations and requirements, but also in our industry, they're constantly changing. This is an ever changing industry. So what is the compliance officer or what is their role? So the compliance officer has two main responsibilities. The first one is to develop and the next one is to implement the practice compliance program. So the compliance officer should have knowledge in many, many areas, including business administration, clinical activities, coding, billing, reimbursement, risk management, and at least a general knowledge of the laws and regulations that are applicable to the medical practice environment. 
the compliance officer should also have good judgment and the ability to prioritize. And some other duties includes, I mean, when you go in and you're looking for compliance officers and their role, you see that it is very broad. It's, it's There's a lot of different things that the compliance officers help and do, but some of those duties include to develop and or review policies and procedures that implement the compliance program, attend um, orientation staff meetings or operation staff meetings as well, monitor compliance performance by operational areas, enforce disciplinary standards and ensure consistency. That's huge. Implement systems for assessment of risk, developed an auditing work plan, review auditing and monitoring reports. Also, they might even coordinate with human resources as, you know, maybe some of the issues that are brought over or, you know, maybe some of the employees are bringing over into the compliance department might actually not be a compliance issue, but a human resource issue. And also they monitor effectiveness of corrective action. So overall, guys, compliance officers, they assure compliance with all facets of HIPAA rules developing and maintaining the compliance plan, training the staff and the providers, and also correcting any irregularities, okay? Um, I was recently in a webinar, and one of the things that they said about compliance officers is that they should be loyal, responsible, and trustworthy, okay? This person is usually a person that is very influential within the organization. You know, you're dealing with the staff, the providers, the chief officers, the board of directors. So it has to be somebody that is loyal, responsible, and trustworthy, okay? And they have to have the authority to be able to work in the compliance plan, implement the compliance plan, and also maintain that compliance plan because the compliance compliance plan has to be what we like to call a living, breathing document, which we'll talk about later on. But how do you know if your organization needs a compliance plan or not? How do you know? So I have some questions that you can ask yourself, and these questions came from CMS and their Medic uh, Medicare Speaks seminar that I attended last year and some of the questions that they recommend to ask yourself to determine whether or not you need a compliance plan are, does the nature of the practice or facility justify a compliance program? One. Two, does your practice or facility policies or compensation systems encourage for aggressive coding and billing practices? Three, does your practice or facility already have a firm commitment to practicing within the law? Four, does your practice or facility have effective internal controls to ensure compliance with federal and state regulatory requirements? And final, the fifth one, is your practice or facility part of a larger organization that has a compliance program for all of its practice or facilities or location. So I think the biggest thing that you need to know is before you're able to determine whether or not your facility needs one is you need to understand what is the compliance plan, okay? What is your organization's compliance plan? And also, have you been trained on the compliance plan? So those are things that you might also wanna ask yourself. Does my organization have one, yes or no? If it does, do you know where it is? Have you been trained on it? Those are, to me, the first questions that you wanna also ask yourself to determine whether or not you need a compliance plan and also to know, to say, hey, um, do we have a compliance plan? Uh, are we gonna be trained on the compliance plan anytime soon? So. Having a compliance plan has a lot of benefits. So besides abiding by, and this is besides abiding by the laws and regulations. So some of them, but include, but are not limited to an increased potential of proper submission of claims, the reduction of billing mistakes, improved results of um, reviews that are conducted on Medicare claims, 
also avoid potential fraud, waste, and abuse, and it also helps to promote patient safety and ensure delivery of high-quality patient care. So as you can see, compliant affects the office as part of the, the, you know, the staff and also the patients that you are seeing. An effective compliance program um, is defined as one that avoid or minimize liabilities, including legal or regulatory penalties and potential civil litigation, okay? So as I mentioned earlier, the challenge for developing an effective program gets complicated because of the ever-changing legal and regulatory environment that we are in. So new laws and regulations come into play literally on a daily basis, you know, from different levels of government. And we have seen that right now with coronavirus, you know, um, you know, this is how we code it. And then two days later, this is how we code it. This is the diagnosis code you're going to use. Then this is the procedure code that you're going to report. So we are in an ever changing legal and regulatory environment. So to avoid having an effective compliance programs, the OIG, the Office of Inspector General, has described seven basic components of an effective compliance program. Okay, and these are number one, conducting internal monitoring and auditing, two, implementing compliance and practice standards, three, designating a compliance officer or someone to monitor compliance, four, conducting appropriate training and education, five, responding appropriately to detected violations, six, developing open lines of communication, and seven, enforcing disciplinary standards through weld publicized guidelines. So these seven components are going to provide you and your office a solid basis for a HIPAA compliance program. Okay. And something that I mentioned earlier is that your compliance plan needs to be a living, breathing document. That is one of the most important characteristics of a compliance plan. But what does that mean? What does a living, breathing document mean? Well, ask yourself the following questions. I know I have tons of questions for you to ask yourself. Number one, is the risk assessment current? Is the risk assessment current? Has there been any updates? Okay, have we learned any lessons? Have we had any issues that need to be addressed? Have they been added to the compliance plan? Have you learned about this new uh, updates that have happened within your compliance plan. So that's what it means to have a living, breathing document, okay? Living, breathing document, it is updated regularly to show the most updated laws and regulations and even anything that, any issues that you have had, How? Uh, what are you gonna do to prevent it? How are you gonna make sure that it does not happen again? Okay, so it needs to be monitored and updated regularly, okay, to align with any updates and any new discoveries, okay? The truth is, is that compliance has evolved right now, guys, into more than just reimbursement issues and even applications of modifiers and bundling edits, okay? Fraud and abuse is a real thing and compliance officers need to be focused on what's going on right now, um, especially now with coronavirus too. So as I mentioned, the Office of Inspector General, OIG, described those seven basic components of an effective compliance program. Okay, so we have seven. So let's take a look. Well, you can't really see it, but let's discuss each of these components individually. So the very first component is implementing compliance and practice standards. What is this? These are your written policies and procedures, okay? They have to be clearly written and they have to also describe all expectations in detail. These should be reviewed with new employees right away within their first 90 days of your employees being hired and also annually because remember, you are doing what? Regularly reviewing it and updating it. This is a living, breathing document. Step number two, this is designating a compliance officer or someone to monitor compliance. So this is overall your compliance plan 
oversight. And we already talked about the roles and the duties of a compliance officer. Guys, if you go out on the internet and research the duties or um, you know what does a compliance officer do or does, you're gonna come up with just a lot of amazing uh, different things and roles and duties that they do. If you need um, you know, a little bit more or if you want me to elaborate a little bit more on this, please do not hesitate to contact me. Again, they're responsible, I'm just gonna tell you a couple, they're responsible for the development of the compliance program. They also roll out the compliance program. They um, distribute the compliance program and they make sure that all the employees are properly trained on this program and then conduct the necessary training and maintenance of it. Okay, so that's like an, uh, you know, at, at a smaller scale, <laughs> at a smaller scale, that's what they do. Component number three, this is conducting appropriate training and education. And guys, training and education in our industry is gold. And it's gold because you need the right tools to be able to do your job effectively, right? Effectively and efficiently. So this is a breathing, living, breathing document. As you make any update, your employees need to be appropriately trained on any of these new updates, okay? So this is very, very important. So first, you have your written policies. Two, you have a person that is going to be responsible for this. And then three, then we have to train and educate the staff, the employee, everybody within the organization. And you know, those could happen in uh, remote learning doesn't always have to be face to face. Um, sometimes it, within large organizations, you might have like intranet communications or newsletters from maybe like the compliance department. Also, um, you know, as you're reviewing these things, bringing in scenarios, scenarios that employees can actually take a look at and say, okay, what would you do in these cases? And also any result of any investigations of non-compliance should be part of, of what you're training your employees on. Component number four is having open lines of communication. So this means that there needs to be an open door policy, okay, with compliance or at least with someone, the compliance officer, compliance committee, different employers have different things, but you should be able to do it in person, report an issue in person or even do it anonymous. You know, some employers will have like a toll-free hotline, but the biggest thing with having an open door policy is that all employee concerns need to be investigated. Okay, we need to make sure that we're showing the employees that we're following up. That way employees don't feel like, you know, nobody's gonna do anything about it. I'm just not gonna even waste my time. So we wanna make sure that we are reviewing all employee concerns, okay? because we want to make sure that the employees felt that we know, see and know that we are following up on any issues, okay? And if any of those issues are HR related, as I mentioned earlier, then you can go ahead and have HR follow up, okay? Compliance plan component number five, this is conducting internal monitoring and auditing. So this includes, you know, monitoring that needs to occur on a regular basis during normal operations and is performed by staff. Auditing needs to be performed at least, at least annually or even more frequently. And it all depends, you know, it all depends if you audit it, for example, one of your coders, maybe they didn't meet your standards and you might need to, you know, show them that you would need to show them the results and then audit them more frequently. One of the biggest things with auditing, guys, and I'm gonna tell you this, but one of the biggest thing is that sometimes we audit the employees, but the employees never get the findings or any recommendations. So not only do we need to audit, but we also, our findings, we need to have a written report containing those findings and recommendations, and these need to be presented to the employees because you wanna make sure that they can rectify the issue or you wanna make sure they don't continue making the same mistake. Okay. You also need to monitor any um, risk, make a risk assessment so that you can monitor and audit any areas of concern. Okay. You want to make sure that you are monitoring and auditing your work plans. 
and also include any corrective actions. For example, what are you going to do for any repayment of overpayment or disciplinary actions against a responsible employee? So all of these things is not just a matter of documenting. You also have to make sure that you're training your staff in those findings and what they need to do to be better. Okay. Compliance plan component number six. Number six, this is enforcing disciplinary standards through well-publicized guidelines. So this is the response to detected offenses. So how are you going to respond to that? Okay. Are you going to, you need to make sure that you are outlining a plan on how internal investigations will be conducted. You know, what is the time limit for closing that investigation and also have your corrective actions, the different options, you know, what are the options, what are you going to do, and also how you're going to do it. If these investigations will be performed by an outside independent contractor, or if this is something that will be handled all internally. The last component of our compliance plan, component number seven, is responding appropriately to detected violations. So, this includes consistent discipline, okay? So such as clearly written standards describing the expectations as well as any consequences for non-compliant, unethical, and also illegal behaviors. And also includes that corrective action, okay? So I always like to think about uh, component number six and component number seven going, you know, hand in hand with each other because you have enforcing the disciplinary standards, through well-publicized guidelines, and then you have responding appropriately to those detected violations, okay? So some mm -hmm. risk areas, some of the risk areas are going that you need to have in your compliance plan. There is a lot, but you need to look back at the history of the practice. You need to learn from any issues that have occurred in the past and also monitor those issues to make sure that they are resolved and monitor them to do what? To make sure that these do not happen again. Um, also identify any state and federal billing, coding, and documentation requirements that would apply to your practice because you want to make sure that these are being followed and these are being done. I recently um, attended a NamUs webinar, NamUs the National Alliance of Medical Auditing Specialists, and they had a list of different areas that they suggest to have within a compliance plan. Some of the more risk areas are things like incident two, cloning, um, missed application of modifiers, determining medical necessity. We know how big that is clinical plagiarism. They also say not only monitor your risk areas, but also police the low risk areas. And those are things like your monetary gift laws, your anti-kickback statutes, and any stark related issues. So you have to, you don't want to just monitor the high risk areas because you also need to know what is going on with everything else. So since compliance, let's talk a little bit about culture of compliance, because I believe that compliance applies to everyone within the organization. So every organization should have a culture of compliance. The OIG has a list of five practical tips for creating a culture of compliance, and they are as follows. Number one, make compliance plans a priority. Two, know your fraud and abuse high risk areas. Three, manage your financial relationships. Four, just because your competitor is doing something doesn't mean that you should do it and it does not mean that you can, okay? And number five, when in doubt, ask for help. When in doubt, ask for help. They also provide a phone number that you can call to report suspect um, practices. And that is 1-800-HHS-TIPS. 1-800-HHS-TIPS. T-I-P-S. Okay. So I want you guys to think about this for a minute. Okay. I want you to think of three questions actually maybe more than three question. Does your organization have a compliance plan? Is it well designed? Have you been trained on the compliance plan? Okay. Is it effective? You know, how do we know that it is working? Are you aware of any findings? So let me ask you all one last question. I promise one last question at the end of the day, 
who is ultimately responsible for compliance? Think about that. Let that just marinate for a minute. Okay. So guys, with fraud enforcement initiatives that are increasing, we need to have compliance plans because they are going to help our risk. Okay. According to CMS, the implementation of a good compliance program would aid in better protecting a practice from the risk of improper conduct. By implementing a comprehensive compliance program, and this is from physician's practice, a practice can find and correct potential vulnerabilities while minimizing billing mistakes, reducing the chance of an audit, increasing payment of claims, reducing the chance of fraud and abuse, and promoting safe and quality care. Healthcare providers that have not yet implemented a compliance plan, I urge you today to use those seven core elements as a foundation for your program. So I, I want to talk to all of you and I want to have like a heart to heart for just one minute here. Just a heart to heart between me and you. No one else is listening, just you and me. I said at the beginning, compliance is near and dear to my heart. But I really want to make sure that all of you, all of you, all of you with no exception are aware of all of the changes. You are aware of the necessity of a compliance program and also the value of compliance, of learning compliance today and yesterday. Okay, but we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about right now. You need to be aware. We need to be aware of what is happening in healthcare compliance and with healthcare compliance. We need to prepare ourselves about any changes in laws and regulations and how they are going to or how they are currently affecting each and every one of us. So at the end of the day, we are all, I'm going to say that one more time, we are all responsible for compliance. You need to know what is right, what is wrong, and when in doubt, ask. So that is going to conclude today's episode, guys. Uh, again, this is an amazing topic. There is so much information out there. Please, if you have any more questions, reach out to me. You're able to leave me a message right on the uh, podcast platform. You can always write to me. And um, because remember, I said this was a partnership. I don't know if you guys remember that, but I do. This is a partnership. I want to know what are some of the things you want me to, some of the topics you want me to cover, some of the things that you need answers to that maybe you have not yet received an answer to. And, you know, most importantly, make sure that you making use of your resources, go into the OIG, go into CMS, you know, go into the AAPC's website, name is doctor's management, CMS, and make sure that you always have the most updated information. Thank you all so much for listening to this episode and I will catch you on our next one. Thank you guys.